So is there a way to destroy spike protein? We did one video on this topic already. We're going to follow up with another video talking exactly about that, a new potential method of how you could destroy spike protein. But additional question is going to go along uh, with that question today. Can you also destroy clotting? And specifically what we're going to focus today is on a compound called N-acetylcysteine. Okay, so this is a compound that someone emailed me about after I did my previous video about destroying spike protein. Remember that was a video talking about natokinase. And in that video, I also mentioned that, that natokinase could be involved in destroying clotting as well. This is going to become important down the road because for the last couple months, I've been studying lots of scientific literature on, on the new emerging theory that microclotting might be an issue associated with severe COVID or long COVID. Okay, so this is going to be something we'll be hearing about more often, I think, in the coming future. So uh, interesting that both the narcinase as well as the topic of today's video and acetylcysteine could be involved in both the destruction of the spike protein as well as the microclots that seem to be a problem associated with, with some of the COVID disease symptoms. All right, so now before I get to explaining how the mechanism of how N-acetylcysteine uh, could be working, and let's talk about a little bit how proteins are formed, and this is important for the background. Let's see if I can catch these guys for you in the video, getting ready. <laughs> uh, and so, spy, uh, proteins, remember proteins are basically molecular robots that are made inside your cells where the genetic code is the blueprint that determines how these proteins are supposed to be made. So genes basically is the genetic code that, that tells the cell how to make specific protein. Once that protein is made, it's a molecular robot that does specific functions inside the cells. We make thousands of these very different ones. How are they made? Is they are made based on different amino acid, acids being linked together in a long singular chain. So when you make a protein at first, it's just a chain of different amino acids linked together. But we all know proteins have complex three-dimensional shape. They are literally tiny little robots. So you need to go from the single chain into this 3D robot. And the way you achieve that is because if you think about it, of course, amino acids are made out of atoms. And all atoms, for sake of simplicity, we're just going to say they have some electric charge attached to them. Of course, there can be also neutrality. But again, for sake of simplicity, let's just think that all atoms have some charge uh, amongst them. And therefore, amino acids are also charged. And how they are charged, some of them are going to be more positively charged, some of them are going to be more negatively charged. And they can start influence that, that can start influencing how amino acids are going to start interacting with each other and help determine the buildup of uh, the final three dimensional shape. But proteins can also cheat and they can create bridges among different, among, among different amino acids that could be located in a very far location on a single molecular chain of amino acids, but in that three-dimensional shape, they can come close to each other and they can be linked together in, into a bridge. So a couple, one amino acid that participates in this particular phenomenon is cysteine. What's interesting about cysteine amino acid is, is that it ends in an atom called sulfur. Yeah, like sulfur, like this sulfur. <laughs> so that sulfur has a unique property or it has a certain property that allows it to bond with itself and make a bridge, if you will. So it actually form two sulfur atoms can from distant locations can come together and they'll form a bridge. It's called disulfide bridge. And that's how you can maintain three-dimensional shape of proteins and ensure that that they they don't disassociate easily. So this is a trick proteins can use to make sure that they remain and maintain their their desired three-dimensional shape. Okay, so why do I bring this up? And this is where the N-acetylcysteine comes in because N-acetylcysteine, as the name suggests, there's cysteine there, cysteine chemical compound, like the amino acid, and it also has that sulfur atom. And that sulfur atom and N-acetylcysteine can be used to start 
dissolving those bridges between sulfur atoms that are found between cysteine amino acids in different locations of the proteins. So it, it can actually go in and start breaking those bonds apart. And that means the protein where that it would be under such a attack from N-acetylcysteine would actually potentially start mm, unfolding itself because you, you mess up with three-dimensional shape. Okay, so that's how it forms, but N-acetylcysteine, it's, it's a compound that is already used in medically. It can be prescribed, it's a, it's a mucolytic mutual, uh, agent, meaning it actually is prescribed to break down the mucus. And uh, so it can be so that if you have a mucus and you take N-acetylcysteine, it allows you to cough up your phlegm easier, okay? That's how it works. Uh, and the, the suspicion is how it works is precisely because it starts breaking down those disulfide bridges between sulfur atoms inside the mucus proteins, and therefore those proteins fall apart and it, and it allows the mucus to be more liquefied and then it, you can cough it up easier. So that's how, that's why it's prescribed currently medically. All right, so then what about why spike protein and why and acetylcysteine being used with the spike protein? Because like many proteins, spike protein also has cysteine amino acids. And some of these cysteine amino acids do participate in, in the formation of those disulfide bridges. So from memory, I could be wrong about this, but I think, I think what uh, spike protein has about 16 cysteine amino acids and eight of those participate in those making those bond bridges. So basically that means is that in spike protein, you find four of these bond bridges between cysteine amino acids. And three of them I think are buried so that an acetylcysteine could not access it. But one of those bonds is found on the surface, close to the surface of the spike protein, which could suggest that an acetylcysteine could reach it and destroy it. And finally we get to the paper I wanted to tell you about today. And in this paper, basically what happened is the authors wanted to test that theory. They looked what they treated spike protein with N acetylcysteine and they were able to show that indeed one that specific bond that's close or between two cysteine amino acids of the spike protein that were close to the surface of the spike protein were able to be broken down by the by treatment of N acetylcysteine. So that means A could suggest that maybe N acetylcysteine could be used to destroy spike protein. And to further confirm that they also did molecular mm, modeling of the spike protein. And according to that modeling, it's actually crazy. Apparently, if you break that bond, again, remember, this is modeling. So, so you, you know, it's not 100% certain. Uh, according to that model, the part of the spike protein where you break that bond between those two cysteine amino acids by tr the treatment of NAC and acetylcysteine, it dissolves that part of the of the spike protein completely. It literally just like it loses its three dimensional shape, and it now becomes a single loop of of a, of amino acids linked together. So so it really breaks down the three dimensional shape of the of the protein. So maybe it could be used as a treatment to destroy spike protein inside the inside our bodies. Maybe we don't know. This is a hypothesis only. But the authors are also looked into whether and acetylcysteine could prevent virus from infecting cells by treating the virus first with an acetylcysteine. And according to them, they were able to show that yes, indeed, that, that was, uh, they were able to do that and they were able to inhibit virus inhibition uh, with such treatment at fairly uh, low concentration. However, <laughs> before we get all super excited, let me tell you how science works and, and and just because you find some information in science, it doesn't mean it's necessarily accurate because I wanted to let you know that I found another paper that also looked for an acetylcysteine as a treatment against spike protein. Yes, they were also able to confirm that that bond between cysteine residues and the spike protein could be broken down. But unlike the paper I just mentioned, the second paper, they were not able to show that they were able to inhibit the virus with the treat from infecting the cells that they were looking in the lab 
with the treatment of an acetylcysteine unless they reach really high concentrations. And again, from memory, I believe that they were looking at almost thousand fold higher concentrations than that looked at previous papers. So you can see in this case, we are dealing with two mm, separate, different contradictory results. This is very common in science. So whenever anyone tells you trust science, you should always ask, well, <clears throat> how much um, basis do we have to truly trust this science? Because Sci this is very normal to have contradictory results in science, and then you have to wait for a buildup of rep repeated knowledge. So you need reproducibility before we know how something works, and this is why a lot of the times in science we take a lot of information based on faith. So this does not certainly mean, hey, n acetylcysteine is something we should be thinking uh, automatically as a treatment. But I'm going to now bring, out, bring it up to the clot. So I've been like, as I mentioned, I've been studying clotting, microclotting in association to COVID for a long time, months now. There's so much literature that, uh, that I've missed that I'm really catching up. And I can tell you that there's an emerging theory right now that microclotting could be a big problem when it comes to COVID, including long COVID. It might be responsible, amongst other things, for some of the symptoms that we are now witnessing in long COVID patients. And I think we'll be hearing a lot about micro, micro clotting, so don't be surprised. It's going to be a new type of knowledge that, that I think we're going to be hearing a lot about. So now, why do I bring up micro clotting? Because there's another paper a while back, this is old paper now, that looked at N-acetylcysteine for being able to destroy micro clots. And the way, if you look at into, into the clots that are being studied in COVID patients, they obviously you can imagine who's the biggest bad culprit here and that's the spike protein another big one and i'll be summarizing this in a future video so stay tuned another big one is fibrin but i'll mention one more might as well start bringing these these many different players bad players into the picture another one is is inflammatory factor called willebrand willebrand factor and it and that one it helps to start building a mesh. It can actually start building a mesh and it's called polym it can polymerize and make like chains of, it, of itself. And it interacts with platelets as well, as well as fibrin. And together, all of these players can come together amongst others, there's others as well, come together and it can start forming a clot, okay? So how an acetylcysteine might be helping against dissolving these clots is because once again the bridges that are being made by this willebrand factor in inflammatory factor is once again by making those disulfide bridges okay so and here comes an acetylcysteine you can dissolve those bridges and this is how it can start liquefying those clots if you will making them more solid or start dissolving them there's many other components in, that we have as well in how we can be treating clotting I think, again, in terms of treatment of clots, there's going to be a big topic coming in the future. Don't be surprised. We, ha we already know of some, but here are new emerging methods of potentially how uh, we might have to be looking at fighting this clotting because I think clotting might be a, a common problem in the future. So this one I thought it was very interesting. I thought I would share the, the authors of that, of that now third paper that I'm talking about. They looked at it under multiple different mm, mm, study methods, including in the lab, as well as inside mice, animals. And it looked very effective in, in being able to dissolve clots by dissolving the, the mesh that the Willebrand factor forms with each other, as well as potentially between the fibrin as well. So very interesting stuff. All right, that's all I have for you today. <laughs> we need to get down off of this mountain. So uh, in the meantime, Thank you everyone for support of the channel, for your support of this channel. Thanks for being a fan. Thanks for all the questions you're asking. I look forward to seeing some of you at the next coming up COVID Q&A event. If you want free tickets to that, please subscribe to our newsletter. Links to all of that is in the description below. And finally, hey guys, um, stay healthy. Uh, take care of your immune system. That means stay active and no better way to do it than getting out for a brief, uh, brief gentle walk in mother nature <laughs> bye everyone